Reading through the Bible in one year, February 15th, Genesis 48, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 80, Job chapter 14, and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. When it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you. Israel collected his strength and sat up in bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful, rather, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and I will make you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. Now, your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. But your offspring uh, that have been born after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the names of their brothers in their inheritance. Now, as for me, when I came from Paddan, Rachel died to my sorrow in the land of Canaan on the journey. And there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, These are my sons, whom God has given me here. So he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were so dim from age that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them close to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face, and behold, God has let me see your children as well. Now, uh, sorry, then Joseph took them from his knees and bowed with his face to the ground. Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand uh, toward Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right, and brought them close to him. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God whom my father, uh, rather, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all the day, uh, sorry, all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And may my name live on in them, in the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's um, head, it displeased him. And he grasped his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, "Not, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also will become a people, and he also will be great. However, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. He blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessing, saying, May God make you like Ephraim of Manasseh. Oh, excuse me. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I will give you one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and bow. And... Yep, then we're going to go through the... Uh, the the blessings of the sons individually tomorrow. That's a good story. We're gonna we're gonna discuss some of that. But now let's go to Luke chapter one, verse thirty nine through eighty. We'll finish out that book now. Now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. 
How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to see me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what has been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble estate of his bondslave. For behold, from this time on, all, uh, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has uh, scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and has sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned home. Rather, re it's just going to be one of these days. Then returned to her home. Now, the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise a child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. Well, they made signs to his father as to what he they rather as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, His name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he began uh, to speak in praise of God. Fear came upon all those living around them, and all these matters were talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them uh, kept them in their mind, saying, what, what then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. In the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his uh, holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation, by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Now, here we go. Job 14. Job continues. Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Like a flower, he comes forth and withers. He also flees like a shadow and does not remain. You also open your eyes upon him, or eyes, yeah. You also open your eyes on him and bring him into judgment with yourself. Who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you, and his limits you have set so that he cannot pass. You turn your gaze from him that he may rest until he fulfills his day like a hired man. For there is hope for a, for a tree when it is cut down that it will sprout again, and its shoots will not fail. 
Though its roots grow um, old in the ground, and its stump dies in the dry soil, at the scent of water it will flourish and put forth sprigs like a plant. But a man dies and lays prostrate. Man expires, and where is he? As water evaporates from the sea, and a river becomes parched and dried up, so man lies down and does not rise until the heavens are no longer. He will not awake nor be aroused out of his sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath returns to you, that you would set a limit for me and remember me. If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my struggle I will wait until my change comes. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands, for now you number my steps. You do not observe my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and you wrap up my iniquity. But the falling mountain crumbles away, and the rock moves from its place. Water wears away stones, its torrents wash away the dust of the earth, so you destroy man's hope. You forever overpower him, and he departs. You change his appearance and send him away. His sons achieve honor, but he does not know it. Or they become insignificant, but he does not perceive it. But his body pains him, and he mourns only for himself. It's okay, his friend's going to respond and, and remind him of how terrible he really is. It'll be great. So much fun. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul continues. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message my preaching were, were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do not speak. Starting over. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man. All that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, and no one knows uh, except the Spirit of... Let me rephrase that. Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, because we had that beforehand, right? But now we have the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God which things we, we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man, a worldly man, one who has not yet been converted, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness against stupidity to him, and he cannot understand them. Why? because they are spiritually discerned. Again, it's like you handed somebody a Greek, um, uh, sorry, a, a, a 
a document in Greek, and he's never read Greek before in his life. He doesn't know any of the characters. He doesn't know any of the words. He knows none of these things. You just hand it to him, and you say, isn't this great? He's going to think you're insane. He doesn't know a single thing about what's written there. He can't discern it because these things are spiritually discerned. He has to have the new heart. He has to have the Spirit of God living within him. And that's the only way that he can understand these things. But he is who is rather, but he who is spiritual appraises all things. Yet he himself is appraised by no one, judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we, we have the mind of Christ. Behold the word of the Lord. 